with the hand clap of praise. Come on and put your hands together. If we want to welcome you here, we want to thank you for logging on wherever you are. We just want to say thank you. If you would stand on your feet, if you're able and worship the Lord with us. Come on. God has been so good. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, we worship you today. Oh, yeah. Over the mountains and the seas, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth. And I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing of when your love came down. I can sing of your love forever. 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 Over the mountains and the sea, your rivers run with love for me. And I will gladly lift my hands and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth. of your love forever I can sing of your love forever I can sing of your love forever oh God I can sing of your love forever oh I feel like dancing yeah. it's foolishness I know seen the light they'll be dancing joy like we're dancing now i can sing of your love forever 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 I can sing of your love forever. 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 I can sing of your love. Forever, I 
can sing of your love forever. Come on and put your hands together for God. Have you ever just felt his spirit and felt a giddiness in your spirit? Come on and dance for Jesus. It might seem foolish to the world, but in the spirit of God, in the presence of God, he fills us. We feel him. God, God, we love you today. God, we worship you for what you've done on Calvary. Thank you for giving your only son for me. Even though I don't deserve it, you still continue to give me grace. Oh, God, you're worthy. God, you're faithful. We love you, we love you, we love you, God. Oh, we love you, God. Oh, without the music, how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And now we'll see how great, how great is our God. Come on, sing it with me one more time. Say how great, how great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. All in all, in all we we'll sing how great, how great is our God. I just got to say this one part. You're the name above all names. Oh, God, you are worthy of all praise. Oh, and my heart will sing how great is our God. Just worship within your heart. See how great, whisper it, is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all, and all will see how great, how great is our God. God, we come to you today and we acknowledge your greatness for what it is. No matter what we do, God, you still are great. No matter what the news says, God, you are still great. No matter how we're feeling, God, you are still great. Nothing can change that. You are the great God that you were yesterday. You are the great God that you are today. You are the great God that you were in the Old Testament, the New Testament, every single day. You are still great. God, we honor you today. We worship you today. We pour our hearts out to you today. God, we lay it all at this altar because you know what? You can handle it. Be with Pastor Sean today as he delivers the word of God to your people. May you equip him with everything he needs to say the right thing to the right person, God. May we be open and receiving. Sometimes what we hear might hurt a little bit. It might mess our ego up a little bit. But God, if it's from you, then that's exactly what we needed to hear. 
God, may your people find peace in this upcoming week. May they walk a little extra upright because they know my God is great, period. We love you. We praise you. We honor your holy name. Together we say amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, God. worthy. Truly he is compassionate. Truly he is great. Exceedingly abundantly beyond what we could ask or imagine is our God. He is faithful. He is kind. He is loving. He is just. He's our protector, our healer. He's our shelter in a time of storm. How great is our God? We cannot describe him with words. How great is our God? We exalt your name this day, Father. And, and as they prayed earlier and worshiped earlier, Lord God, we ask that you will continue, Lord God. Continue to speak through this service, Lord God. Continue, Lord God, to meet and minister to your people. Continue to be God in this place, God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And amen. How great is our God. Today's sermon is entitled, The Tale of Two Davids. And we're going to study about just how comfort cripples kings. If you've got a Bible or an iPad or however you find the word, just go to 2 Samuel chapter 11. And we're going to be there most of the time. And it says, then it happened. In the spring, at the time when the kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroy the sons of Ammon and besiege Rabbah. But David stayed in Jerusalem. The tale of two Davids. You see, nothing good happens when you surrender your God-given position. The opening verse says, when the kings went out to battle, David sent Joab. It is almost like a what had happened was story. You know, nothing good comes after somebody says what had happened was. You know, at some point they've disappointed somebody or they've forgotten something. And if they were going to pick you up at 10 o'clock and it's 950 and they say what had happened was you might as well catch an Uber. Because that means they are not going to be there. You see, what had happened was the kings went out to war in the spring. And David sent someone in his place. So easily we give up the authority that God has given us. Because that was David's place to go to war. You see, Joab, as good a servant as he was, he wasn't king. He wasn't anointed by God for, to be a king. He didn't own the crown, and he wasn't for that purpose that day to lead the people. And not only did David send Ammon, he sent him with his servants. He sent him with the army. He sent him with everyone. And so often, don't we don't only give up our authority, we give up our giftings and we give up everything else just because in a moment we don't want to do what God has called us to do. The interesting part of the scripture is that it was spring. Spring normally follows winter. The season is just a little bit darker and a little bit colder. And some of us occasionally eat a little bit too much because we know we could we could hide away in sweaters during the winter time. And so sometimes winter is a time in our lives where we become undisciplined. Because we know in winter nobody's really watching what's going on. And, and so David had spent a winter indoors. And now it's spring and David is still feeling winterish. And for many of us, 2020 was like winter. It was long. It was dark. Some of us lost friends. Some of us lost families, lost homes, lost jobs. 
but it's springtime now. Tell somebody it's springtime now. If you've got it in the chat, put it in the chat. It's springtime now. And now that winter is over, what are you going to do? Because you could sit at home like it's still winter, like David did. Or you could send someone else in your place, like David did. Or you could embrace spring and do the very thing you thought couldn't happen. Because it's springtime now. And praise God that spring always follows winter. You see, I call it a tale of two Davids because this wasn't always the kind of decision that David made. You see, David had a winter earlier than this winter. It was a time when he was a boy and the prophet Samuel was about to anoint a king from Jesse's house. And David was so not even considered by his dad that when Samuel came to the house and said, God's going to anoint a king. David didn't even get called. He didn't. And all his brothers marched in front of Samuel. And Samuel said, look, this ain't dumb. Is there anyone else left? And his father said, it's just, you know, I've got one more son, the, the youngest. He's, but he's out there with the sheep. And Samuel said, we're not going to eat until he comes in. We're not going to sit down until he comes in because God said a king is in this house and nobody in this house is that person yet. And you see, it doesn't matter where you are in winter. God can still find you. And it doesn't matter that no one else considers you. God can still find you because the prophet wasn't going to leave till the son came that was supposed to be king. And so they called him in. And of course, you know how the story goes. This was the one who God wanted Samuel anointed. And although he was king, he was still a shepherd. Because the Bible said that Samuel went along his way and, and David was still a shepherd. He was still watching sheep. Although anointed king, he was still watching sheep. And so often it is hard for us to stay on post after we heard something from God. And sometimes God does want you to be king, but he wants you to be shepherd first. You see, because Israel already had a king, but God wanted a shepherd to shepherd his people. You see, what David's job was primarily was to watch after his father's flock. That is what he told Saul. He said, I watch after my father's flock. God wasn't just looking for someone to rule over his people. He was looking for someone to shepherd his people. And so David had to shepherd a little longer so he could be a good king. And sometimes we jump out a little too soon because what God wants to use you in, you're in already. And what he wants to do in you, you're doing it now. And he wants you to perfect it. And he wants you to do it a little bit better. So when that moment come, when springtime comes, you could run out in spring. So we've got to understand the seasons that we're in. When you're in winter, be in winter. And winter isn't, for some people, winter is just a dark, dismal, I'm going to eat too much time. But David, it wasn't so. Winter was a time where he was growing. Winter was a time when he was shepherding. Winter was a time when he was doing his job. So when springtime comes, he's able to perform in spring. And springtime, sure enough, came for young David. You see, long after, after he was anointed king in chapter 16, there was a war going on with Goliath and the Philistines. And nobody wanted to face Goliath because he was, he was a real giant. Nine foot tall and everybody was scared. And David's father asked him to like, look, go see what's going on with your other brothers and let me know what the battle's like. And so David goes out. And as he's going out there, out of obedience to his dad, not realizing it's springtime for him in that moment, because this is a moment when everybody gets to see who he is and what God is doing in him. 
And so David goes out. And the Bible says he hears the Philistine hurling insults at Israel. And he starts to inquire. And his brothers got mad at him and his brother said, look, where, who did you leave the few sheep with? But David got taken to Saul and, and Saul asked him, he says, look, how are you going to fight this man? Because he's been a fighter since he's been a youth and you're still a youth now. But David remembered how he was a shepherd. And he says, look, I used to shepherd my father's flock. And every now and again, a bear would attack him. And every now and then, a lion would attack him. And they would take the sheep. And he said, I will get them. And he said he would grab them by the beard and he would club them to death. And he'd get the sheep back. You see, two things that jumped out to me there. David's brother said, what are you doing? Who did you leave the few sheep with? David said, I shepherd my father's sheep. Don't allow anybody else's limiting belief of you to find your reality. David's brother thought that he was just shepherding a few sheep. David said, I was shepherding my father's sheep. God said, I'm going to make you a shepherd of my sheep. So don't worry what everybody else sees. It is totally irrelevant what their reality of you is. Your reality is based on God's opinion of you. And so David could have stepped thinking, all I got is just a few sheep when God is trying to give him a whole nation. But he never operated like he had a few sheep. He operated like he was a shepherd. Because the Bible said when he left the sheep, he left the sheep with a shepherd. You see, back in those days, you could have left the sheep with a hired hand. Somebody to just watch him for a little bit. And the Bible called him a hireling. David didn't leave his father's sheep with a hireling. He left his father's sheep with a shepherd because that is the heart that God wanted. He wanted someone to care for his people so much that they will always have his people in mind. And that's who David was. And so in the spring of our lives, we all have an option. We could do one of two things. We could either go out and do what God has called us to do or we could send Joab to do it for us. You see, David went down and he faced Goliath. And you know how the story ends. God helped him. He got a stone. Goliath fell. Goliath died. He cut his head off. But what would have happened? How different would that story have been if David didn't go? How different would that story have been if David didn't go? Before David went, all he was to everybody else was a shepherd boy. Anointed by God, but a shepherd boy. What the king said is anyone that kills Goliath, not only will I make rich, I will give my daughter and their family will be exempt from taxes. Whole family exempt from taxes. David went in there a shepherd boy. He came out of winter a shepherd boy. He walked into his spring a married man, wealthy, that never pay taxes again. It's a difference between doing what God has called you to do in that moment. Had he not gone, he wouldn't have never received everything God has for him. And so the Bible says, when the kings went out to war, David sent Joab. How different does time make things? The teenage David went himself. The grown king sent somebody else. You see, sin finds a way to snowball. Proverbs 24, verses 32 and 34 says, Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come upon you as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. It does not take much. The Bible said it was a little sleep. It was a little slumber. Sometimes it's the little things that compounds together that pulls down a man. It's not the big things. It's not the huge thing. No one wakes up and robs a bank. They don't. They take a couple dollars from their mother's purse. 
They take a couple dollars from somebody else's pocket. And eventually they rob a bank. It's the little things. You see, David got a little comfortable. He's king now. And so he doesn't have to fight every battle. God knows he's fought a lot. And sometimes we get to this place in our lives and our walk where we just get tired. And I really just don't want to fight no more. And maybe somebody else could do this one, God. Somebody else could sing this song. After all, I've sung every week. They got nobody else to play the drums. Could they pick somebody else on keys? And we surrender what God has given us because we're tired of doing the same thing over and over. And David might have gotten tired of fighting. So the Bible says he sent Joab. And verse 2 says, Now when evening came, David arose from his bed. And he walked around the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful in appearance. David sent to inquire about the woman. Stop there for a second. This lady lives close enough to David's house that he could see that she's beautiful. Not just that she's naked, but she's beautiful. And he has no idea who she is. That is the thing about walking in your purpose. That lady lived next to him his whole life as a king, probably. And he never even saw her one time but this day. When you are in your purpose, you are protected almost by purpose. Because when you're in your purpose, then your eyes are fixed on where you're going. This is not the first time David's been on his roof. This is not the first time that he's, that lady has walked by. It is not, but it's the first time he noticed. Because he wasn't where he was supposed to be. And when you're not where you're supposed to be, you notice more things. Have you ever been lost driving? When you are lost, you could tell everything on the road. You see people's socks. You see the deer. You see Everything when you, because you are so distracted by being lost, everything becomes substantial. It's like a drowning man. You will pull twigs and leaves and everything. When you are on purpose, you don't notice the things that are not in your purpose. When you are out of purpose, you notice everything. So the same woman has lived next to him his whole life is now beautiful. She wasn't beautiful last week. She wasn't beautiful the week before. She's beautiful now because when the kings went out to war, David decided to stay at home. And the Bible said he woke up in the evening, in the afternoon, actually. David slept all day. Woke up late. And I always wondered, right? Why this woman bathing on her roof in the first place? I always, that was my wonder. But the reality of it is, the men aren't supposed to be home. David wasn't supposed to be there. The kings went out to war. The only person supposed to be in David's house is his wives, his concubines, and the little children. None of which would be affected by her bathing on the roof. All the men were gone. David was out of position, not the lady. This wasn't Bathsheba's issue. This was David's issue. Had David gone to where he was supposed to be, we we wouldn't even know the story of Bathsheba. Because what she would have done is probably what every other woman did that day. And nobody knows any. There was no other stories that came out. Because no other men were home. Only David was home. And so the Bible says, David inquired about the woman. And one said, it is not Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Everybody need a friend like this. The Bible doesn't say who their name is, but everybody needs one friend like this. A friend that will tell you the truth. He knows exactly what David meant when he asked who she is. And he didn't tell her it was, you know, the girl that's next door. You know, her man ain't home. That's not what he said. He says, isn't it the daughter of da-da-da, 
Meaning David knew who the father was, else he wouldn't have mentioned the father's name. He says, and isn't he the wife of Uriah? Meaning you king and she married. You could have any single woman in the kingdom, but she's married. And so he gently interjected, gently because David is still king, but he gently interjected what truth is. And we all need a friend that in our time of foolishness will tell us the truth. We need someone that will say, this is dumb. I know what you're thinking, but this is dumb. This lady is married to somebody you know. Her, she's a daughter of somebody you know. That is essentially what he told David. And David sent messengers and took her. And when she came to him and laid with him, and when she had purified herself from her uncleanness, she returned to her house. The woman conceived and sent and told David, I am pregnant. James 1 says, let no man say that when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted and carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. David orchestrated this. The Bible says that when temptation comes, we, we can't say we're tempted of God. Because God cannot tempt us. It literally means that we are literally drawn out from God who is our strong refuge by our own desires, enticed by something external and internal that is presented. And when that desire is fully conceived, death comes from it. You see, David had a lot of occasions to interrupt this thing, right? First and foremost, he could have gone to war. He could have been on his post. He could have done his job because had he gone to war, he wouldn't have been here in the first place. Had he been in his purpose, he wouldn't have been here in the first place. You see, the Bible says in Psalms 27, one thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. He will hide me in the secrets of his tent. He will lift me up on a rock. And now will my head be lifted up above my enemies around me. See, God could protect you if you are with him. That's what David said in Psalms 27. He said, one thing that I have desired of the Lord that I will seek after that I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Because when trouble comes, he will hide me right there. You see, had David been in the battle, there would have been nobody bathing. And if they were bathing, they wouldn't have been beautiful. He would have been in the presence of God, under the protection of God, and sometimes, not that trouble doesn't come, it does come, and not that temptation doesn't come, it does come. It comes and it finds us outside of the will of God. And while we are outside of the will of God, we are easier to be drawn away. And so the first thing David could have done was just go to battle. This story would have ended so differently if David just wasn't home. I remember while we were in youth ministry, we would always tell the teens that you cannot, you cannot decide what your morals are going to be in the backseat of a car. You've got to decide before you go on the date what your morals are. Because in that moment, you will not make the right decision. You have to decide what you're going to do before you get there. Because when you get there, there is not enough power if you did not make the decision already. We could ask for God's help while we're in his will. It's kind of late to ask for help outside of his will. 
And this is where David found himself. He found himself outside of the express will of God in that moment. Because the Bible specifically said the kings went out to war, meaning David's place was on the battlefield. And because he found himself on the roof, he saw Bathsheba bathing. And then not only that, he, there was multiple opportunities. He could have gone back inside. The whole house is his, not just the roof. He could have gone back inside. David had wives and concubines. He could have gone back inside. Everything he needed, he had. He could have gone back inside. And so often we fall into temptation and sin because we just won't go back inside. And so he stays on the rooftop. And now this, this, this thing that this, this, this random sighting has become full lust. And now it's being conceived in his heart. Conceived to the point where he's inquiring of her. Somebody tells him who she is and it doesn't make any difference at this time because he is so infatuated in this moment that it doesn't even matter that she's married. Because that's what sin does. It snowballs. What started as a quick look ends up to be a long look. What ends up, what started as a long look ends up being an inquiry. And what started as an inquiry ends up being go get her. And now she's pregnant. Now she's pregnant. And David had at least 20 different times where he could have stopped this. Temptation will come. Trouble will come. Hardship will come. That that's just life. This is earth. Where is it going to find you? Is it going to find me? In the center of God's will? Or is it going to find me on my rooftop? Because if I'm on my rooftop, I ain't going to make it. If you're on your rooftop, you're not going to make it. The only thing that hides you is the presence of God. That's what Psalm 27 says. He said he will hide me in his, he will conceive me in his, conceal me in his tabernacle. He would hide me in the secret places of his tent. And now will my head be lifted up around my enemies. Now, after God hides you, you could see your way out. You're not going to see your way out until you're hidden. You won't be hidden if you're not with him. So it is impossible not to be with God and resist temptation. It is impossible for David not to, to be on the roof and resist temptation. Because that's what he said. He will hide me in his pavilion. In the secret places, he will hide me. And then, sometimes we're trying to fight a battle in a battle. We've got to look up to look out. And it's only God that lifts. It's like, it's like a, everybody could be a great quarterback with protection. Anybody could pick you apart if you give them a second. It's hard to throw the football while you're scrambling every play. And that's the thing. Our protection is the Lord. We don't get better. We get more grace. We, 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 we get more filled with the Holy Spirit. We're not better people. We're saved. We're not better people. We're filled with God's Holy Spirit. And so if I'm going to step away from God and I'm going to step away from his Holy Spirit and I'm going to step away from his plan for my life, how in the world am I going to succeed? How in the world am I going to resist? How in the world am I going to be strong? If he said, then will my head be lifted up around about me. Now I can see the enemy. Now I can see the plans. Now I can see what's going on. And so often we fall in the same holes because we cannot see. It is hard to navigate in the dark. The same potholes that you miss in the daytime, you don't miss at night. 
because you could see the potholes in the daytime. And what is happening when we step away from God, we step away from light and it's impossible to see the potholes. You see, the Bible said at the end of Psalm 27, it says, and now will my head be lifted up above my enemies round about me. I can see everything around me because I am standing from a place that isn't in the middle of the battle anymore. We cannot fight in the middle. We have to fight above. And we only fight above if God lifts us. And he only lifts us if we're with him. And that was the issue. Sin finds a way of snowballing when we are not with God. And so what started off as a look ended up as a woman pregnant. And so she sends to David and she tells him, look, I'm pregnant. And Second Samuel eleven six says, Then David sent Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked concerning the welfare of Joab and the people in the state of the war. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to the house, your house, and wash your feet. Stop there for a second. David is inquiring about a war that he should have been in. He's asking what's going on. We know we are far from the will of God when we are inquiring about the things we should know. David should have known what was going on in the war. It's not something that he's supposed to be inquiring about. The further we get away from the fire of God is the more we inquire and the less we know. Because the closer you are to the fire is the more you know, so the less you have to inquire. The fact that David was inquiring meant he didn't know. He didn't know because he wasn't there. He wasn't there because he didn't go. And we are stuck inquiring about the things God wants us to know about. Because we refuse to go where he's called us to. We won't read the Bible so we don't know what sin is. And so we keep having to ask questions about things we supposed to know by now. That's what Paul said. He says, by now you should be eating meat and we're still giving you milk. Because we refuse to, after Sunday, pick the Bible up. After the podcast is over, still read the word of God. And so David is caught inquiring about something he's supposed to know. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house, wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house. And a present from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept on the floor of the king's house with all the servants of the Lord and did not go to his own house. Now, when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your own house? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in temporary shelters. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are camping in an open field. Shall I then go to my house and eat? And drink and lay with my wife? By your life and the life of your soul, I will do no such thing. Then David said to Uriah, stay here today also, and tomorrow I will let you go. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now David called him and ate and drank before him and made him drunk. And the evening he went out to lie on his his bed with his Lord's servant, but did not go down to his house. You see, this is Uriah the Hittite's dedication to God's cause was greater than his desire for personal comfort. At some point, we've got to get dedicated to the things of God. You see, David was trying to trick him. David got his wife pregnant, so he assumed that if this guy comes home, he could sleep with his wife. His wife could say she's pregnant. What out? Problem solved. 
But very rarely the sin doesn't come with a cost. And very rarely do our sins not find us out. And when they don't find us out, it's because God is being gracious, not but not because we have so arranged it. God won't be mocked and we don't get to arrange the end. But it tells you something about the heart of Uriah. David asked him, so why didn't you go to your own house? And David said, and Uriah said, not while the ark of the covenant, the ark, the presence of God that Israel carried around with them. He says, not while the ark is in the midst of a battlefield. Why is the king where the ark isn't in the first place? This, this wasn't a dispensation with the Holy Spirit living in you. This was the physical presence of God in an ark with them. You will never be safe if God isn't with us. The blessing is, is that we have the Holy Spirit as believers. So he's literally living in us through his Holy Spirit. So why in the world would David want to be somewhere where the ark isn't? Why is it that we as believers would want something that God isn't in? Uriah the Hittite said, how am I going to go to my house when the ark is in the field, when Joab is in the field, where my brothers in battle are in the field. And he said an open field, meaning that they could be attacked at any moment. Why would I go in my closed house when the ark is in an open field? And so often the decisions we make are crazy. Joab's dedication to the battle and Uriah's dedication to the battle was way greater than their own personal comfort. And every now and again, we got to make decisions that are uncomfortable as believers. And we got to be okay with being uncomfortable sometimes. Because what was comfortable would be, man, I got two days home. And David said his wife was beautiful, so Uriah had a beautiful wife. He could have spent his two days with his beautiful wife. But he said, no, nah, I'm going to sleep right here in the king's house with the king's servants because I don't want to get relaxed. And sometimes we've got to stay in between the tension because that's we, we can't get relaxed. We can't get so used to the presence of God and so used to certain things that sometimes we get relaxed. And it's like if you've been married for a while, don't get relaxed. Because, you know, I, she not going nowhere. He not going nowhere. I don't need to do what I used to do. I don't need to say what I used to say. Why buy flowers? You, I remember it was Valentine's Day and, and, and we're at Publix and, and it was crazy. And I'm hearing two old people and I like to listen to old people. I like old people. I do. But he's talking to her and I guess he walked past the flowers and I guess she was looking at the flowers and his response was, if I got to get you flowers for you to think, it, what did he, he said, if I have to get you flowers, then, if, no, if you don't know that I love you by now, you would never know that I love you. So I don't need to get no flowers because if you don't know, you would never know. And I thought, man, he just, he just missed the whole thing. He just missed, you should get her flowers now because she stayed the 30 years. Or the 20 years. Or the 20. How, you, she should get more flowers year 30 than she got year one. Because she went through more by year 30 than she went through in year one. She might have gone through joblessness. She might have gone through miscarriages. She might have gone through disappointment. She might have gone through so much more by week third, by year 30. And of course he walked past the flowers and I thought, man. He missed the moment because that's what happens when we get too comfortable. We don't think we need to do the things that we were doing all the time. And Uriah refused to be comfortable because his mind was he came for two days. He is going back to battle. He didn't want to get so caught up in the things of this life that he would not be useful for the battle. And so David, when he found out that Uriah wasn't home, decided he'll get him drunk. 
And the irony of it is, even drunk Uriah didn't go home. Sober David slept with Uriah's wife. Drunk Uriah didn't go home. This is what happens when we're out of the will of God. Even easy decisions become hard. How, how committed was Uriah to the cause of God? That even intoxicated, he made the right decision. And how outside of the will of God David was in that moment. Where sober, he made the wrong decision. We have to be close to the cross, believers. We won't make decisions right without Jesus Christ. And the irony of it is... David, before this day, would have been as dedicated as Uriah was. Because that is who David was. And so, although God forgave David, some of the damage was done already. You see, as the story continues in 2 Samuel 12, 7 through 15, by this time, Uriah's already dead because David had him murdered. Because if he's not going to sleep with his wife, his wife can't get pregnant. It's just impossible. They were at battle too long at that point. She can't just show up pregnant today. Because then she'd have to be stoned. Because that was the law. And she probably would say, it's the king. Ain't nobody getting stoned alone. And so, Uriah is dead. David takes this woman and marries her. Probably very quickly because she's already pregnant. Right? And then he decides, well, okay, now that she's pregnant, she could have my child anyway because she's my wife and nobody's going to know the wiser. This is the thing about secrets. There are none. God either covers... Or he reveals. What we confess, he covers. What we cover, he reveals. If you want it to show up, hide it. If you want it to be hidden, tell the Lord. Because if you tell the Lord, he'll hide it for you. Jesus, I failed you. I'm sorry. This is what happened. I need your help. He'll hide it for you. Work around it. Call Uriah home. Get him killed. Get married. He'll reveal it. Because he won't be mocked. And verse 7 of 2 Samuel 12 says, Nathan said to David. Because he had given David a, an example of, of a man that had one sheep and, and, and somebody took his one sheep and they slaughtered it even though they had more sheep and, and David got righteous. You know how we get as church folk. When the sin ain't ours, we get righteous. When they're talking about somebody that don't do what we do, we get righteous. Can't believe this person would do that. How dare she come to church with that on? There's the presence of the Lord. Both of y'all went to the same movie yesterday. Ain't no problem with that. But she kind of, look how short that dress is. Both of y'all had the same dress on yesterday outside of the church. No problem with that. But somehow the presence of the Lord only exists in the building. So Nathan said to David, you are this man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel. It is I who anointed you king over Israel. It is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house, your master's wives into your care. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if it would have been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing this evil in my sight? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house. Because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. 
Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will rise up an evil against you out of your household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companions. And you will lie, and they will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has also taken your sin away. You shall not die. However, because by your deed you have given occasion for the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born of you shall surely die. So Nathan went to his house. Sin does have a price. And for David, it was pretty high. Everything David did in secret was revealed. David took Uriah's wife in secret. David's son took his wives under, literally, as the word said. Everyone knew when David got kicked out the palace by his son. David's daughter got raped by a half-brother. The other half-brother killed the other son. All because David had Uriah the Hittite murdered. Sin has a price. Don't mortgage your future for your moment. Because that's what David did. He could have had anyone. The Bible said, I gave you Judah, Israel, the how I protected you from Saul. He says, and these things were little. I could have given you more. If you wanted more, you would have gotten more. Kings could marry anyone. It wasn't one wife system like today. They had multiple wives. He could have had anyone in the kingdom. He did not need Uriah's wife. And that's the thing about sin. It's not even about what we need as much as what we want. The great news is, the minute David confessed, the prophet said his sin was taken away. As big as the sin was, it was adultery, murder, and understand who Bathsheba was in the economy of Israel. The king called her. She didn't come by choice. The Bible doesn't say whether she was willing or not, but willing or not would have not mattered. The Bible said he was sent guards to get her. She had no option in the matter. So you could add more crimes to it. But very quickly, Nathan said, your sin is forgiven. And so wherever you are today, if you are struggling and wrestling and you know what your sin is, you know the thing you struggle with, you know exactly what it is. God wants to forgive you right now if you'd ask him. Right now, no matter where you are, whether you're in your car, whether you're watching this on, TV, on, on YouTube, wherever you are, if you know you're struggling and you're wrestling, right now God wants to forgive you. And it's just like David said, it was quick. He didn't have a lengthy prayer. He didn't offer sacrifice. He didn't do any of those things. He just confessed to the Lord. He said, I have sinned against the Lord. That was the entire prayer. And so if you're looking at this today, I ask you to bow your head wherever you are. And if you're struggling with something you haven't confessed, I challenge you to confess it to God now. Confess the very thing. And know that he is faithful and just to forgive you of all sin and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. That is what the word says. And maybe you've just never given your heart to the Lord before. 
And that is your sin because the wages of sin is death. But God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. God loves you with an everlasting love. And so if that is you today, I ask you to just wherever you're sitting, standing, walking, talking, repeat after me. God, please forgive me of my sins. Please enter into my heart. Please live within me. And allow me to do the things that please you the most. Allow me to live the life that pleases you the most. In your name, Jesus. And if you are a believer, I challenge you. I challenge you that the winter is over. And the spring is here. And do not send someone else to do your job. You know what God has called you to do. Go do it. He's already equipped you. He's already empowered you. He's already trained you. Go do it. It doesn't matter what people have seen or said or imagined. God has a plan for your life. And maybe it was winter for a while and it doesn't look like what you heard is coming through and it doesn't look like what you've sensed is coming through, but I promise you it is springtime now. And I dare you to step out of winter. Let Take off the heavy coats and do and be who God has called you to be. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. At this time, we will have our offering. And you know, there's three ways that we give. You could either give it online through the website. And some of you guys have been doing that, and we thank you for enabling the work of God to continue. Some people actually slide checks under the door, and that's great too. However you give, give unto the Lord. If this ministry has blessed you, give it here. But give unto the Lord, because truly the work of God has to go on even in the midst of pandemics. Oh, we thank you, Father. Great 
is your grace Great is your mercy towards me Your loving kindness Your loving kindness towards me Your tender mercy Your tender mercy I see day after day, day after day, forever faithful, you're always providing, always providing for me, great is your Great is your grace. Oh God, we worship you today. Oh, 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 oh. So Father God, we thank you. We praise you. We magnify your name, God. We thank you for this offering, God. We thank you for those that gave, Lord God. We thank you for those that wanted to, Lord God, and could not, Lord God. I pray that you would provide, Lord, especially for them, Lord God. Those that, that may not have jobs or, or are in between jobs or, or have been laid off or slowed down, Lord God, that you would somehow miraculously, Lord God, open doors this day, this week, Lord God. Let their phones ring, Lord God. Those that are putting in applications, Lord God, that you would open the door for them, God, you would provide for your people, Lord God, that, oh God, they would, they would glorify you, God. And, oh God, we thank you for this offering, Lord God. And, oh God, we, we thank you for this day, Lord God. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this worship. We thank you, Lord God. We pray now that you would go forth, Lord God. Allow us, your people, to hide ourselves in you, Lord God. Oh, God, let us stay close to the cross this week, Lord God. Let us stay in purpose, on purpose this week, Lord God. Oh, God, every time you nod, let us move, Lord God. Oh, God, direct us in a special way this week, Lord God. Let us have ears to hear, Lord God, and feet to walk, God. God, bless these, your people, God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen.